Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video we're going to be reviewing our concepts about solids, liquids and gases. But first, before we can start um, having a look at some of those concepts, let's recap uh, what we as scientists and as chemists call the particle model of matter. So all the matter that is around you, that you're breathing in and out at the moment, that you're sitting on as you watch this, that you're touching as you hold your pen, as you write in your book, all of these things are matter. And um, all because all the things in the universe are either matter or energy. And so what we as chemists have to say about matter is that all matter, all the matter that you are touching and using and experiencing right now is made up of incredibly tiny particles. And that those tiny particles are far too small for you to see. Um, and that, but, but all matter is made up of a range of different types of tiny particles. That these particles that make up matter are always moving in some way. Um, whether they're vibrating on the spot or whether they're moving from place to place, whether they're spinning around or they're traveling from point A to point B, um, that there is always motion. And that these particles of matter have forces that exist between them and that those forces are, are, are kind of a combination of um, pushing and pulling forces, that is, attractions that pull the particles towards each other and repulsions that kind of push them away from each other. So that these forces are, are constantly going on and describe the behaviour of, of um, what we understand to be matter. Um, so that there's, so there's particles and forces going on at a level that is far too small for us to see. And so now, with that kind of back under our belt, because we've looked at these concepts before, this is not a brand new idea. Um, if, it, if it feels a bit new to you at the moment, then perhaps you need to re review um, this a little bit more closely before you go on. Um, and but so now we're going to I'm going to clear this off and I'm going to start talking about solids, liquids, and gases. Here we have um, some representations of particles in a solid, a liquid, and a gas. Now the color coding here, or the you know the fact that I've got um, blue, red, and yellow d doesn't mean anything in particular. It's just for because that, that's what I have on hand that I can I can use. So what I've done is I, each of these boxes represents a, a sample of that type of substance. And the way that the particles are situated is representative of how they are in, in um, or how we um, represent them to be at the particle level. Um, and then underneath, I've written down some of the features of each of the state of matter or phase of matter is the, the other word that chemists would use to describe this. So we're going to go through each one kind of in turn. Okay, so let's start by having a look at the solid, representing here with the, our blue um, kind of nice cubes or square kind of structure. So in a solid, um, the particles, the solids have a fixed shape, like a particular defined 3D structure um, that tends to be rigid um, as far as that then, you know, that they will maintain that 3D structure. Um, you know, a sugar crystal maintains its, its structure, the glass maintains its structure, um, ice maintains its structure, okay, They're, and one of the other things about it is that, uh, along with that, is that they can't be compressed, so you can't take a solid and if it's, yeah, if it's a kind of one single sort of thing and then actually take it and then squash it down so that it, um, it is smaller than it was before. Now, uh, I not an exception, but one um, way that you might be thinking, okay, well, so that's not always true. Um, you know, I could take a, a container of flour or sugar and put it in a, in a cup and I can take it and I can tap it down or I can squash it down. But the, the problem, what you have there is that actually there's lots of little air pockets between little um, crystals of, of sugar or flour or things like that. And when you're squashing it down, you're just squeezing the air out. And once you get it to the point at which there's no air left, if you tried to squeeze that down further, you couldn't do it. Okay, so that, that might be clear up a source of confusion for you. Um, now, for the most part, solids, because they have a fixed shape and a rigid structure, they can't be poured, or they, we can't easily change their shape. Um, but again, I, I would put the, the exception there that, that might clear up some confusion, is that we there are some solids that we can pour. You could pour sugar out of a cup. You can pour salt out of a container. You can pour flour out of a bag. Um, but the, the only reason you could do that is if that solid is very finely divided or is broken up into smaller pieces that themselves can flow over each other. But that at the particle level, at this level of dealing with what we end up calling atoms, um, that these that's not actually changing this structure. It's just this unit lump 
you know, kind of rolling over another one that's like it. Okay, but so then we move to a liquid. So liquids like water um, or alcohol or uh, olive oil take the shape of their container. So if we took this container, so this represents the particles of a liquid that have settled to the bottom of their container. If we took that container and poured it into something narrower um, and taller, that then it would be narrow and tall. If we took, poured it into something which was wider and flatter, it would take up the bottom of that container. So that, uh, the idea is that it doesn't have a shape of its own that's rigid, that it takes up where, whatever you put it in, um, or if you just pour it on the ground or whatever. Okay, so along with that, that they can be poured or they can flow. Um, we say that they have viscosity, which is kind of um, so a resistance to flow or, or kind of, you know, something that tells us about how easily they would be poured. Um, you know, honey is harder to pour than water, um, for example. But liquids, just like solids, can't be compressed, that the particles themselves are packed very closely together in a less orderly kind of arrangement. Um, because they can roll past each other to, to fill out the container. But if you have still had that sample, you still can't compress it. But then we move on to a gas. Now, gases, like liquids, take the shape of their container. You know, you blow air into a balloon and it takes up the space of that balloon. You know, it stretches it out and then it kind of stays within that shape of container. You take it and you pour it into something else or you put it in a syringe or whatever, it will take up that container, the shape. Um, now the thing about a gas is that that is very distinctly different from liquids and solids is that because the particles of liquids and solids are quite close together, there's a, quite a bit of attraction between those particles to keep it close. That once we break these particles apart, once they become se completely separate from each other, that then we've overcome those attractions and then there aren't any left. So that these particles aren't attracted to each other unless they happen to kind of come super close to each other. But the thing about a gas is that there's heaps and heaps of space between gas particles, which then means that gases, unlike liquids and solids, can be compressed. Because there is so much empty space between the particles, that if you, if you make the container smaller, you're just reducing the amount of empty space between them, um, and, and so you are able to do that in a way that you can't with the others. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to have a look at now, I'm going to clear off some of the, these properties underneath, and now we're going to start to think about how we can actually change between solid, liquid, and gas. So we've identified that we have these three states of matter, but the thing is that we can actually change backwards and forwards between these different states. And so we're going to remind ourselves of what the names of these processes are. And we're going to start with solid, and we're going to work our way over to a gas, and then we're going to have a look at these big loopy arrows at the bottom. So as we go from a solid to a liquid, that's the process of melting. Okay, so we're adding energy in, which is disrupting those attractive particle forces between the particles, so that now that they, while they're close together, that they they are able to move past each other in a way that they couldn't as a solid. If we then take that liquid and we continue uh, to add more energy in to separate those particles out from one another to completely overcome those attractions, uh, that is boiling. Um, and so, you know, like you're taking ice, you're melting it into a liquid water, you keep heating it and you turn it into steam. If we start at the, this end and work our way backwards, and so we keep, we take energy out, we're cooling it down to go from gas to liquid is condensation. If we continue to do so to go from liquid back to solid, uh, we would call it freezing, or perhaps a slightly better, more scientific way would be to say solidification, the making of a solid. Now, the reason that I would say that is that freezing, of course, has connotations for us or has, has a perception for us that it has to be cold in order for this to happen. But the reality is that there's lots of liquids that will turn into a solid at uh, much higher temperatures than we would have at, at, um, at room temperature. You know, for example, we could take lead and we could heat it up to around 400 degrees Celsius and it will melt. And as soon as it kind of cools back down below that level, it will become a solid again. It will solidify. Um, but so if we say that it's frozen into solid lead, it, it kind of sometimes it gives us the wrong impression that our everyday understanding of that word confuses us a bit. So sometimes I would say solidification, while it's longer and a bit more confusing or a bit more complicated, can get the idea across to us a little bit better. Okay, and so now we're going to look at these arrows underneath, which are a little less common and don't happen to all substances, because sometimes we can actually transition directly from a solid to a gas, 
and all back again from a gas to become a solid. Um, so it happens with some substances and in some situations, um, not all. Um, and so we, you may not have experienced it directly, or at least you may not realize that you have. As we go from a solid to a gas, we call that process sublimation. Now that is a U, S-U-B. I just realized that it kind of looks like a, a deformed A. So sublimation, going from a solid to a gas. So solid carbon dioxide, also known as dry ice, will do this It will at, at, at normal room conditions. It goes from solid straight to a gas, bypassing the liquid. That's where it gets its name from, that it doesn't, it's not wet. It doesn't form a liquid in the middle. And we can go back from a gas to a solid. We call it deposition. Um, now, in, in and and um, you've also experienced this, um, sometimes we experience it in really, really cold conditions where we actually go from um, ice crystals that then they can actually evaporate um, and straight to become a gas. Um, or we would call it like freeze drying, that if you if you alter, the, the, the get the conditions just right, that you can actually cause food um, to go from solid to, to make these transitions without actually melting first. And then likewise, that you can have... Um, when you have water vapor in the, in the air and then actually can deposit and form ice crystals straight away before it actually forms um, condensation. So it can happen under the right circumstances. You may not have, uh, have really realized it. Okay, so we've just, we've been talking about the idea that all matter is made up of really tiny particles that are too small to see, but those particles have these forces that exist between them, then they're always moving, that they exist in one of three main states of matter, um, solid, liquid, or gas and that those have particular properties, and that we can transition or change between those different states by adding or removing energy from the, the, that system of particles, and that each of these processes has a particular name. All right, thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.